Hi everyone, welcome to Photo 2022's Headlines Talk Series, Photo Live. It's great to have you here in person with us here at ACME and hello to everyone who's joining us online today. My name's Claire McKenzie and I'm part of the Photo 2022 team. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on whose land we meet today, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography is currently taking place in galleries and public spaces across Melbourne and regional Victoria, featuring 123 artists in 90 exhibitions. The whole festival responds to one theme, being human. Photo Live this evening delves further in, into contemporary human condition and addresses the social and cultural role photography plays in our lives across eight events. We'll also explore through these talks how art can activate cities and public spaces. I'm really excited tonight to introduce our first Photo Live series, First Nations Photography and Culture. Our chair today is Peter Clancy, artist and Associate Dean Indigenous Monash Art Design and Architecture at Monash University, and our guest speakers, James Henry and Dana Claxton, who hopefully will be joining us shortly, who are both Photo 2022 exhibiting artists, and Nikki Cumpston, artist and curator, who's online this evening. I'd like to thank our Photo Live partners, ACME, Metro Tunnel Creative Program, and the Monash Gallery of Art, as well as our education partners, RMIT, uh, uh, Monash University, and Photography Studies College. We hope you enjoy the event and that you can join us for the following photo live talks. The next one's on Thursday. Oh, after this, there's one more this evening and then one on Thursday. And I'll now hand over to Peter. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And thank you very much, Photo 2022, for inviting me to, to chair this event, this really exciting event. Um, so my name is Peter Clancy and I'm a descendant of the Bangarang Nation from southeastern Australia. And I'm really, really excited to have the speakers um, here tonight. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation the other day, um, the four of us, with Dana Claxton, Nikki Cumpston and James Henry. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways where we're meeting, both virtually and in person. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations people who are joining us here, or who may watch the, the recorded video. So uh, in, the, in the room with me, I have um, James Henry. And um, before we start, James, um, we're gonna have a look at some of your work. Uh, I'd just like to, yeah, to acknowledge the audience and uh, people who are here uh, person, you know, face to face. Uh, in terms of questions, we'll have questions at the end of our conversation. So each of the artists are going to present um, the, uh, and talk about their work. And then we're going to have a conversation um, between the four of us. And then if you can hold your questions until then. So for people who are joining us virtually, if you can put your questions in the chat and, um, this, and yeah, I'll be able to answer them, pass them on. Um, so based on our conversation the other day, it was really, really rich and we're in for a big treat tonight because um, the resonances um, between the artists is, is, well, we talked about the idea of being human, which, is a very, very broad, um, but the way that each of the artists, um, First Nations artists, explores photography and the subject matter that they explore is, is just incredibly diverse and incredibly rich and really engaging. Um, James, I saw your work at uh, outside of the old Treasury building the other day and also listened to listen to some of the, the recordings. Um, and it's really beautiful the way that you've, that you've presented the work. Um, you can see from the outside, you can see portraits of elders, Wurundjeri elders or Kulin Nation elders with, um, with their grandchildren. And then if you go around, um, they're captured in their, in their personal spaces. Um, okay, would, 
would you, could we see some of your work? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I was commissioned by the festival to do a series featuring the five elders from the five Kulin nations. And I had to think about what it would be, um, well, how I could integrate that with the theme of being human. And I guess photographing elders, particularly Aboriginal elders, is a, you know, can be you know, quite a sensitive uh, subject matter because um, I guess there's certain respect that you have to give uh, give elders and and you know I guess they have their voice and and you know they're, they're very strong men and women you know with their own um, their own personalities and perspectives so I, I had to honor that and and not um, I guess impose myself too much on that but at the same time you know I guess I had to honor myself as a photographer and an artist and and honor the theme so it was a, it was a bit of a balance and uh, it was an interesting kind of um, you know discussion early on you know w w with the process uh, you know trying to you know work out how to um, I, I guess I guess get, getting down to the the aesthetics of it and it, its place in the uh, in, in the city of Melbourne, uh, its location and, and what what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, you know subject matter would would be there on, on the steps of the uh, Treasury Building. So I was lucky enough to um, to get a, a couple of ideas in there. So what one was, I guess, uh, shooting from a distance uh, where you, you can see them. Um, I guess within, you know, somewhat within their like home or suburban environment, um, but then showing off, uh, I guess the, the the urban landscape of, uh, you know, not only uh, the the vegetation but also the uh, the, the power lines, the uh, you know the, the roads, the the buildings, and uh, all, all these other things where I, I guess you know for, for Aboriginal people. They uh, well, we see that we're walking you know, in two worlds mm -hmm. in, in a way like uh, you know, this uh, you know contemporary world that we're all familiar with, but then also you know holding on to you know I guess that connection with uh, you know country and, and nature mm -hmm. and, and such, um, and, and then uh, I was able to you know get in into you know people's uh, into people's homes, and uh, you know like here you know j I, I kind of wanted to explore the idea of what what it was like to have um have a cup of tea with your grandma so instead of just uh, you know taking photos of the elders on their own i wanted to uh, show the elders uh, in their home environment uh having uh i guess a genuine interaction with their grandchildren as they might normally and uh, i guess there's that uh, cliche that uh, it's not just with aboriginal people but with also, um, I guess a lot of other cultures that um, you know, there's that uh, you know having a cup of tea. It's it, it, it's a or I guess you know here you know there's the, the one of the grandkids having a having a coke. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess um, yeah that uh, that time to you know sit down and, and have some kind of meaningful connection with with the grandparent. It g gives people an opportunity to see these people uh, in a personal light uh, as opposed to say you know where we're not normally seeing them is you know uh, up on microphones giving welcome to countries or um, or having uh, art exhibitions or um, you know doing other things more in the public eye uh, so uh, here this is um, Ani Marlene Gilson with uh, her grandchildren uh, Indigo and Ryder and yeah it was, it was just a matter of just taking a bunch of shots and and then seeing yeah, which, and let, letting them do what they would normally do. Um, you, you know, of course, make sure the the lighting was appropriate. Uh, I was in a in, in appropriate spot, and it can kind of show off some of the character of the of the home. And I kind of felt that you know, like th through through a portrait, uh, it can only say you know so much. Seeing someone's face, but I, I think that you know what people choose to you know have in their home, uh, partic particularly a, a home they've lived in for decades. It uh, shows, you know, I guess the the, the people. Um, I'll just uh, quickly go on to the next one. So, you know, this is qu quite a different 
uh, home environment and um, and you know, so this is uh, Uncle Taljim Edwards and his uh, grandson Oscar uh, and yeah th so this is them um, I guess uh, yeah in, in much more a humble setting but I, I guess it, it's kind of showing a, a what I was trying to get get across as well is that there, uh, at least my feeling, there's more diversity within the Aboriginal community mm. than there is difference between uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Uh, now that's at least in the in the, in the cooler nations. Like, I guess if you go to other parts of the country, there there's much more a dis distinct difference between. You know, Aboriginal people and, and white people within the same uh, environment, but um, yeah, in, in responding to you know being human, I, I wanted to be able to show that uh, come across, um, and I, I guess part of that uh, you know too, you know something that we're we're all familiar with in in Melbourne, uh, Annie Carolyn Briggs, uh, Nawit Carolyn Briggs, she um, you know, wanted a photo with her grandchildren in I guess away from her home uh, which which is fine like um, so we you know, were able to you know get in into a cafe in uh, in St Kilda and, and have some photos uh, out and about in St Kilda instead and yeah I guess that um, yeah, I guess kind of shows that connection that uh, she would, you know, her grandkids also have with um, with, with the rest of non-Aboriginal Melbourne in, in the way that you know we, we interact, as opposed to what just you know, like being Aboriginal, being this uh, thing that is so so different and unique from everyone else. Mm. Yeah, they're they're really fascinating photographs, and I think thinking about the the connection between. Um, your work, Dana and Nikki, it's you're very much looking at, at these at connection and and ties of connection and intergenerational knowledge. Um, it's really interesting the way that you've chosen to photograph the subjects, I think. Um, you were talking about the the sensitive kind of nature of um, photographing elders um, and also people of different generations. Um, it's it's really interesting that you're it's almost like the camera is not, like you're not there. Mm. Like the camera is, is recording what, what's occurring. Yeah, yeah. That I guess that's you know part of me. You're know, wanting to, uh, I guess honour them as as much as I could, but also to have uh, a certain degree of truth mm. uh, coming come across within the images and um, and to um, to kind of. Um, to you know, strengthen that you know idea of, of, of honesty, that's why I thought thought it you know quite appropriate to have the the audio recordings of them you know talking about their own experience and, and not having you know me as a photographer you know dictate you mm. know what is going to be you know their representation. Mm. You know, there, there's only you know ten images and two Im Im images of each family that I felt. You know, wouldn't um, wouldn't do enough justice to you know expressing their perspective and and me you know of course I've got my own perspective which is of being Aboriginal and, and Aboriginality so I, I didn't necessarily want uh, that to kind of um, uh, you know be the only thing coming across and so there's a chance for them to uh, speak for themselves you know via the audio recordings mm. yeah the audio recordings are really beautiful there so you can either do the QR code when you're looking at the work, or you can listen to them online as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they're really beautiful. I think the relationship between image and and sound, um, you get, it's it's like what was going on at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like that idea. I, I imagine you know, like you see a whole lot of people uh, walking in in the city with their headphones on their way to work or, or something, and so uh, to to stop in and and 
maybe just have like even for a split second, you know, that moment where you, you're listening to the audio and you, you, you're seeing the images, you know, like these two metre high images. And I was trying to kind of get the, the size of the people to you know, be, you know, somewhat similar to what you would, you know, experience in, in person. So it uh, kind of feels like you're in there, mm. uh, you know, in, in the same cafe or in, in, the, in their kitchen or lounge room. Mm. Uh, to then hear the images, uh, I'm sorry, uh, hear the uh, the audio uh, while looking at the images, and I guess be somewhat immersed mm. uh, in in that uh, you know particular time and place. And um, I think as well, like you know, we were just you know talking before about you know recording our um, you know, our you know parents and grandparents and. Uh, and yeah, you know, I, I guess you know, like having lost uh, you know, family members, you kind of wish that um, you know that there was uh, yeah, there was more content to be able to look back and remember them. Yeah, you know, th- these days I, I guess everyone's got their you know phones and and you know getting video and and uh, this and that. But um, yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, for, for some people don't realise it until you, you get to a certain age where you you actually want to hear and appreciate these stories that mm. your, um, your, your grandparents uh, or your, your parents have, um, you have not have had a chance to, to record. So, um, yeah, like, I, I don't know, ho- hopefully it might also inspire people to to you know take the time to you know sit down with a, a recording device and you know hear you know some of these stories but also perspectives of their families mm, mm. yeah and and also just, just thinking about the site where they are located like being at old treasury house and the and what that represents in terms of colonization um, so it's where you know say during the gold rush where um so many Aboriginal people were cleared off in Victoria, cleared off the traditional lands. Like it's, it's just, um, it's really potent to have the photographs of the elders at that site. I think mm. at Old Treasury House. Yeah, um, uh, Uncle Bill Nicholson was uh, doing a welcome to country at uh, at one of the launches, and then he told the story of how. Um, uh, I believe it was William Barrack who like walked all the way down from from Corinderk to um, uh, to I guess express his uh, displeasure of how the Aboriginal people were were treated uh, you know back in the time uh, back in the day and so you know I guess the you know these buildings still standing and and having um, you know of course it's a very colonial structure but um, you know through that it you know also has a bit of an Aboriginal history and. I guess it's uh, it's it's nice to see certain places uh, be uh, be reclaimed, you know, in in what is you know, I guess a new a new Australia compared to you know when it was uh, constructed and why it was constructed. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you know certain things like that are uh, little landmarks in in the the progress of Australia and it's. Uh, Acknowledgement and respect of Aboriginal people. So yeah, it's a, it's nice to you know be, be a part of that story and, mm. and to be able to uh, honour the uh, the call of nations uh, through the images in in this way. Mm. But particularly mm. me, I, I guess I'm not you know from these parts. You know, I'm f- from Sydney and originally you know, mobbed uh, from all around New South Wales. So um, yeah, I, I really kind of appreciate the. Um, uh, the, the the trust and um, you know opportunity that the uh, call and mm. nation elders have, have given me uh, to to do this a- and the festival of course. Mm. Yeah, it's a really beautiful presentation. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, now I'd like to introduce you to Nikki Compson, who um, is an amazing artist and curator. Uh, so let's have a look at some of your work, Nikki. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, 
Oh, Nikki. Yes. Uh, we've got the presentation here. Uh, oh. So if if you'd like to jump back on, like get rid yes. of share screen. Yes. Um, and then we've got the first image up here. We thought it was nice so that we can see your face sure. Um, sure. on the screen, so in the room. Okay. Yep. Um, so, and then we've got the first um, slide up. So if you'd like to uh, talk about, start your presentation and we'll yep. prompt, uh, just say next slide and then that will prompt the next slide. The wonderful technicians who are working very hard at the back will be able to okay. advance the next slide. Yep, so this is, this is the first slide. <laughs> Great, hi everyone. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that I'm here today on the lands of the Ghana people. I live in Port Adelaide and I've lived and worked here for over 30 years, um, but I'm actually a Basenji person. I'm an artist and a, a writer and a, a curator. And um, I, I just want to acknowledge my, my elders, my Basenji elders. We're from the Barker, our Darling River. Our family lives between Menindi, Broken Hill, <laughs> Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, <laughs> you name it, we're all over the place. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that, that we're, we're here today and that we're all on many different countries and just like to pay my respect and, and honour the, the work that the elders do every single day to support the younger generation to be the elders of tomorrow and also to acknowledge all of the work they do, caring, caring for country and caring for culture. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, I, I thought I'd start with an image that, that really comes from over 20 years ago, but it was a project that I worked on which enabled me to go home, visit family and make new friends and to meet people from all over Australia. It was, it was an opportunity that the State Library of South Australia gave to myself and another photographer who's since passed away, Andrew Dunbar. And so we went out and photographed Aboriginal people. It was for an Adelaide Festival exhibition in the year 2000. And so this was a way for us to break down stereotypes of who we are as Aboriginal people. And so we each created 50 photographs and with those photographs was a, a text where the people wrote up to 200, 250 words. Some people wrote essays, <laughs> other people wrote like one sentence that really talked about who they were and what they, what they thought and felt you know, was important for them for the future from their own Aboriginal perspective and what they wanted to share with the world, really. So this is my cousin, Fiona Kelly, who is the pr very proud mother of her two beautiful children, Marley and Jani. And this photograph for me just captured, it captures who we are as humans, you know, as human beings. It's showing the care, the joy, the love, and the sharing of, of you know, of us with each other in order to nurture and care for each other. And for me, that's one of the most important things to be human is to be kind and, and to be open and to enable people to be themselves. So I just wanted to start with this image because I felt like the theme for the festival being human. For me, you know, at that time when I started creating these photographs, our mum had just passed away and, you know, we were all really devastated. It was a really difficult time for us. But the way that I could see through it was to keep busy and to be able to share, you know, the, to break down these stereotypes that were constantly, you know, we were being battled with every day of our lives as Aboriginal people. And so... This project really enabled me to help support other Aboriginal people to have their say and to work with them to think about how, you know, how they could be um, depicted. So each, each different group of people or people 
thought about how they wanted to be portrayed. Some people brought, you know, photographs out of magazines that, that they, you know, really liked the look of this or other people were happy for, for us to work together to just, you know, go for walks and, and just share stories and think about, you know, the light and the way that, the way that um, you know, they felt when they were in a particular place. So it was a wonderful project and it ended up traveling as part of the uh, Pacific Festival of the Arts to Numea in the year 2000, which was quite an incredible opportunity uh, to have you know, the works taken over there. Um, but yes, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and since then, if we could show the next image, please. So since then, I've, I've, really, I've really been focusing on the waterways and, and you know, the precious trees that are part of the, the Murray-Darling Basin system, as it's become known as. Um, but of course, it's, you know, our precious, our precious Barker is, you know, our river, the, the, Bar the Barkindji people are you know, responsible, culturally responsible for the Barker, which of course flows into the River Murray uh, in the town of Wentworth. And it travels all the way down to the mouth of the Murray, which is at Kumarunk, which is the Ngarrindjiri name for the mouth of the River Murray, which flows out to sea through the township of Gulwa as it's known now. So this incredible waterway is it's so important to all of Australia. And there, at, at one particular point in the 2000s, there was the flood that went for, sorry, the flood, the drought that went for more than 10 years. And this particular image was created in a backwater of the River Murray. And it's just not very far from the mission, the Gerard mission. And this is the home of the first peoples of the River Murray and Mallee region. And this particular tree was a tree that, that normally would have been, there wouldn't have been any water surrounding this tree. And what happened was during, during the drought, a whole lot of money was spent in re repopulating this area with water in order to give the little saplings of the river red gums a chance to rejuvenate and, and to grow. And so this was the result of, of one of those particular floodings where they, they, they pumped water into this region. And I just happened to come by it at this particular time. And it was just, you know, it's one of those incredibly majestic river red gums full of life, full of birds and all sorts of, you know, different scars and markings on these trees through these backwaters. But this particular tree was a, a tree that, that we'd gone to when, when I was a kid and, and we used to, you know, play around this tree. But to see it in, in this beautiful waterway was just incredible. And so I went back over a period of, period of about five days in the morning and in the late afternoon and photographed it in all its glory. And so this particular image is a black and white photograph. And it was then, um, I printed it black and white and then I hand colored it. And that's one of the things I love doing, having that opportunity to spend time back with the photograph in my studio, just slowly working up the color and leaving, you know, parts of it black and white, but then, you know, lovingly going in and, and adding color, not necessarily the color that I saw while I was there, but just giving it a feel for how I felt when I was there photographing it. And the next image, please. So this is another image of that time during that, that drought. And this is actually around a, a lake called Lake Bonnie. Um, lake Bonnie is in the Riverland of South Australia and it's a freshwater lake. It's one of the largest freshwater lakes in South Australia. And during this particular drought, the water was 
the fresh water from the River Murray was cut off from coming into the lake. This is just on the actual shoreline of the lake, this particular image. And you can see that each and every, there's no trees. The, the trees are all just stumps. And that's a result of the trees being ring barked and used as firewood. And, you know, walking around this area, there's, it's salt encrusted from the salt, the salinity in, in the lake rising as a result of the lack of fresh water coming into the lake. And so as you walk around, it's almost like you're walking on snow. It's, you know, this crisp, crunchy, salty kind of surface on top of the clay, the clay pan there. But I just couldn't quite believe that, that you would ring back every single tree, that you wouldn't leave one tree. Um, yeah, it's just part of that uh, way of, you know, Western society and the way that, that, that places are exploited, but, you know, at, at what cost? And you can't go back from that. And you, know, you can plant more trees, sure, but you know, it takes many, many years for these, you know, trees to, to be regenerated. So that was, you know, an image that I just felt was, just showed the absurdity of it all, really. Okay, the next image, please. And this is almost, if I turned around from that previous image on the shoreline, if I then turned around and looked at the lake um, behind me, well, this, this is the scene that we see. And, you know, it's, it's the most beautiful lake. And you can see that there are many, many trees in the lake that have, that have you know, been flooded. So where those trees all are is, is the original shoreline for the lake. But in the early 1900s, when the locks and the weirs were, were put in place for irrigation in order to be able to control the amount of water coming in and out of the lake, the lake became a lot bigger than it normally was. And so that resulted in this, um, you know, in, in the trees dying because they, they had too much water for too long. But these, you know, these particular areas, when the drought was, was in full force, you could walk around right up to the trees because the water receded. And you could see, you could, you know, be one on one with these beautiful trees and you could see the scars you could really feel the presence of Aboriginal people in all of the, the remains that were left in and around the lake itself. So there, there are middens, which are full of shells, charcoal, different bones, where Aboriginal people have come together and gathered and met and exchanged knowledge and information. So up to 12 different language groups would travel along the length of, of the Murray and the Barker, the Darling, and come together and exchange and have these big gatherings. So this has gone on for tens of thousands of years and the middens that are there are a result of those exchanges. So next image, please. This is a more recent image from a journey I did back up the Barker in 2020, once again in drought and absolute devastation. The waterways were almost non-existent. There were big green slimy pools of, of water where there was once a, once a raging river. It was, it was a really devastating time. It was early in the year around March, April that I, I went up to Will Canyon and it was, it was just one of the most terrible experiences that I've had really. Just witnessing, you know, people with no water, not being able to run air conditioners, no fresh water to drink, there's no water in the, in the water tanks and, and just the livelihood of the river and, you know, how, how much that means to us as, you know, as human beings, to be able to to go fishing, to, to cool ourselves by the by the water, to be able to swim, you know, it's it's such an important part of life, especially for people who live on on the rivers. You know, they they grow their 
their food. You know, like there's, it's just, it's just devastating when, when you witness that. And for the people living there, I just can't imagine how difficult it must be. But this particular image is a beautiful, majestic old river red gum. And I felt, you know, that, that it just could tell so many stories. There's a scar at the base of that tree. There are many rings um, where the branches are formed and being formed together by Aboriginal people. And you can see those rings traveling all the way up the tree, indicating that, that this is a place of abundance, that this is an, an important location. And it was actually at a, a really beautiful spot on the river, just down from this tree is the actual riverway. So this is another image of black and white that I've created on a medium format um, camera and then printed the negatives and hand colored it as well, quite subtly um, in this case. But yes, I, I create these portraits of these trees as a way to, to honor them and as a way for us to have a point of discussion to begin the conversations about what's happening with climate change, what's happening with greed and over allocation and theft of water. And how can we, how can we, you know, make change by talking about this and acknowledging it in a real, a real way. Okay, the next image, please. So this is the final image. Um, I called this <laughs> Barker Messenger. It's created just in the backwaters once again of the River Murray. I felt while I was here, I had a, a few signs this particular afternoon. Uh, that, that I was on the right track. A kookaburra came and there's a baby kookaburra and it spent a lot of time with me uh, this particular afternoon. And I always feel that, that, that the waterways, no matter where I am on, on the Murray, that, that the Barker, the waters have come down from, from the Barker, from the Darling River. And there are messages that, that come down that waterway there are, you know, there are stories, you know, there are memories in my mind. And this particular image is, is one that, that I feel, you know, the peace, I feel clarity and, and you know, the joy of, of being able to, to spend time on country and, and, and to be productive with my camera, one-on-one, -on -one, just walking, thinking, feeling. And, and I know that my ancestors are, are close. I know that my mum is close. You know, there, there is um, life and, and it gives me strength to be able to uh, create images like this and to be able to share them. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Nikki. That was um, <clears throat> really, really fascinating and amazing to, to have you give us that precious um, narrative and share so generously with us um, your practice. My pleasure. <laughs> it's really interesting um, just you're know, thinking about um, like the, the last image you showed was great grandmother Barker. Um, we've got a, a scar tree, a Boon Morang scar tree at, at Monash um, and it's in one of the buildings and um, it's on like a like a platform and it was saved um, from farmland out near Bacchus Marsh, I think. And um, it's, it, we view it as, as an ancestor. Um, Nawit, Ani Caroline talks about it as, as, as an ancestor, a Boon Wurrung ancestor. And I think those, those connections, like your, your work, James, is, um, is exploring familial connections. Um, but the relationship that Aboriginal people have with with trees, with the environment, um, is is really really powerful. And I just love the the narrative that you that you talk about uh, when you were talking about one of the images in relationship to you know you playing there as a child. So that sense of memory, but also that the trees are um, not only do they do they reveal, like with the scarring, and do they reveal um, 
ancestors and you know the the cultural practice over thousands of years they also have a really powerful um, familial presence that comes through really powerfully in your in your work and I think also um, showing the first image of your of your cousin Fiona and and with her children leading on to to showing us your wonderful images of of the um, of the trees and and the landscape or, or of country, um, yeah, it's really really beautiful and fascinating. Thank Talking you. about your relationship with with the trees, I was also um, based on our conversation the other day. I was really fascinated by. I think it was um, was it one of the photographs you showed was taken at Lake Bonnie, and the. So a lot of um, the trees that are actually in water now, so before invasion, they actually weren't underwater. Um, and then you talked about how at one point the water had receded. I think that was something that was done, a governmental decision. Mm -hmm. So the water receded and then you could actually see the middens, which you mentioned when you were talking before. Um, but I just think that's that's so fascinating that the water was was protecting culture but at the same time covering it and the fact that um you know this the the waterway the murray darling system has been uh very damaged by culture um you know by government decisions and private decisions um but the that actual act has actually revealed incredible cultural presence of um, Aboriginal people. It's just really, really fascinating, yeah. so poetic. Yes, and I, and I think that, that it's interesting how something that was actually terrible with the, the closing off of the, the fresh water coming into the lake, it was terrible for the town and for all of the people living there because the lake turned into this pool of sulfuric acid. So it smelt like rotten egg gas through the town. It, the, the fish were dying, the turtles were dying. And the one good thing that happened was that, that there was more acknowledgement for Aboriginal connection and cultural connection to that site through the revelation of the cultural material that was, that was being revealed. Mm. So it was, you know, it was very... <laughs> It was twofold, really. That that it was um, it was a terrible situation, which then was rectified eventually when they allowed the fresh water back in. But it also did make for change to start happening, and more acknowledgement for the um, the first peoples of the River Murray and Mallee region. And now they they've got all sorts of ranger programs in place. They have started to block off access to to the places that are precious and that are, have important sites. Whereas before people could just ride their motorbikes, drive their four wheel drives over. Now they've got allocated camping areas. So it's really, in the last you know 15 years or so, there's been some really major changes that have happened. Mm. Um, so yes, I think you know it's been really interesting to see how that's progressed. Mm. Out, of, for, out of something that is, mm. you know, environmental kind of disaster, but yeah. yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, we might um, hand it over to the audience. So thank you so much, James and Nikki, for your powerful presentations and for sharing your work with us. Um, just wondering, does, does anyone here um, have any questions for James or Nikki, anyone who's in the room? Uh, any thoughts or observations? You don't have to. Um, and it's just wondering if, if anyone online has any questions that they've popped in the chat. No questions or thoughts? Yeah, 
Uh, hi everyone, I am Nina and uh, okay. Um, hi everyone, I am Nina. Thanks uh, both of you for your beautiful, beautiful work. And my question is if um, do you feel your art is heard in this uh, in this Western civilization? Do you think you you feel you have a space? your art have a space in in modern society and do you think the people put in value a first nation photography and culture do you feel hurt through your art yeah, uh, well I, I guess i um i'm probably primarily a, a commercial photographer and i I wouldn't have, um, yeah. I wouldn't have otherwise, have, you know, had a chance to, uh, uh, you know, share my thoughts and feelings if it wasn't for the the invite from uh, from Photo to uh, to exhibit and to be able to, I guess, uh, you know, share these images and and have this have this platform. So I I feel that um, I think I think there are a bunch of. Uh, um, Aboriginal and other First Nations photographers uh, represented in this festival. Um, I, I also, uh, you know, work as a musician and um, and work a bit with theatre. And yeah, there, there seems to be you know, more and more uh, opportunities for uh, Aboriginal stories to uh, to be presented and experienced and and heard. So. Um, yeah, it, it seems like there's a there's a great thirst for it. Uh, there's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, politically, there's a, um, a, a process of of truth telling that, that they talk about, where I guess they're, they're wanting to, um, I guess, share uh, you know a Aboriginal experiences and and have it become a part of you know Australian uh, you know contemporary and ancient history. So. I guess that's happening, you know, there on an academic level. But uh, I guess through that, and, uh, and I guess the the general climate is also giving this um, opportunity for artists to to share their experiences and perspectives. Uh, as to you know how much it it um, reaches the the mainstream, um, uh, it might not necessarily be to to the same extent as. I guess uh, artistic communities, but um, yeah, de definitely more and more you're seeing um, you know black faces on on TV and uh, you know not just painted ones. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, would you like to respond to the to the question? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, that's how I've been able to express myself. You know, since I went to art school, and you know, that I started learning about photography in the late 80s and it's been my way of being able to share my stories and ideas and I feel like there is certainly an audience and there is you know an abundance of us now creating you know photographic imagery that that is sharing who we are as Aboriginal people and I think it's a platform that without without it I don't I wouldn't I'd go mad so whether or not there's an audience, I'm still, you know, always going to make work because it's important to me to be able to share ideas and, you know, it's who I am, I guess. So yes, there's definitely an audience and, and it's, it's certainly important um, for us to be part of that, that story. Mm. I think photography has been um, an incredibly powerful medium for, for Aboriginal people to to have a sense of agency and mm -hmm. um, to tell Aboriginal people to tell their own stories. Um, be, yeah. But it's a really fascinating because it is, it is such a, it can be a really objective medium and it, and it has been used, to, pardon me, as an ethnographic tool yeah. um, by yeah. colonisation. So it, it's a kind of a double-edged sword, I find. And it's important for us to be able to talk back to that ourselves. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Well, 
I think we've come to the end of, of our session. So I would... Oh, there's one more question. Thank you. This is a question for Nikki from Pippa. Um, Nikki, can you tell us more about what hand colouring colouring brings to your work and how you go about it and how do you feel when you're doing it? Ah. <laughs> it's, um, it's something that I learned from a, a terrific mentor, Kate Brakey. And Kate is an artist, a photographic artist, who originally was from Port Lincoln in South Australia and who now lives in the United States. She lives in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I've had the, you know, the joy of being able to learn how to hand colour from her initially in the first year of, of me being at art school. And then since then, I've had opportunities where we've, we've got together and um, done I, I was a mentee as part of her returning artist residency to South Australia. And I am actually about to meet up with her again uh, this weekend. She's come home for a few weeks. So we're going to have another session together. Um, but it's something that, that I've always worked with film. I still continue to work with film. I do have a digital camera that I, you know, fiddle around with, but I don't usually do a lot for exhibition from those images. So I still create the black and white images and then print them up. I don't work myself in a dark room anymore. I, I used to, but just, I just don't have the time. So the negatives are scanned and then I print them onto different types of paper. And I will then hand colour using either watercolour, uh, acrylic, all transparent colours, or um, Stabilo crayons or uh, pencils, and I'll just work the image. It's something that I, I love because it gives me time back with the image, back on, back on that country with that, the thoughts and, and the ideas and the feelings that I had when I was there. I guess I used to have that time in the dark room and that would give me a chance to, to really think about what it is that I'm why, why am I working with this image? What is it about this particular place? And, and so that helps me articulate my ideas so that I can then write about the work and talk about it. So it's that precious one-on-one -on -one time with the actual image that, that I think is what I get out of it and the feelings that I, that I re, you know, re kind of thought about from the time of being out on country. And also I love color. <laughs> I love being able to play and mix colour and and um, and that technique of you know, just different techniques of being able to apply colour, apply water, and and what that what happens when you do that. Um, every single work that I hand colour, I have this anticipation before I start, and it's like, oh, why did I think I could do this? <laughs> um, but then it just starts to flow and. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 a real love. It's a thing that I I really love doing and enjoy doing. <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, just spending time with an image mm. is is really a really beautiful process and honouring that image yeah. and the connections that it brings and the connection the connection with light that it that it has had when you took the photograph. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both for sharing. W w was that the last question? Yes, yes. So thank you both, Nikki and, and James, for sharing your your practice and your your work and your ideas and your time with us. And thank you to the audiences here and online. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.